200 degrees. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. If you, O Lord, kept the record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we have gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise. Receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness, confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, being saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, his mercy has given his son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. So call and ordain a servant of Christ and by his authority. I therefore forgive you all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue the intro printed in bulletin. I will speak of your testimonies before kings, O Lord. They shall not be I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord. Blessed are the people who know the festival shout. We exalt in your name all the day. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I will speak of your testimony before kings, O Lord.
the Savior Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Father once, God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. St. James the Elder. This is from Acts chapter 11. At that time, some prophets came from Jerusalem down to Antioch. One of them, by the name of Agabus, got up and by the Spirit predicted that there would be a big famine over all the world. The king, while Claudius was in the world. Every one of the disciples decided, as he was able, to send relief to the fellow Christians living in Judea. They did this by sending Barnabas and Saul to bring it to the spiritual leaders. And at that time, King Herod arrested some members of the church in order to mistreat them. He killed John's brother, James, with a sword. When he saw how the Jews liked that, he arrested Peter, too. And happened during the Passover days of bread without yeast. When he arrested Peter, he put him in prison. And had 16 soldiers and squads of foreign guard guard him. He wanted to bring him before the people after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle lessons from Romans chapter 8. We know that God works all things out for good to those who love God. We are called according to his plan. Those whom he chose from the first he also appointed long ago. To be thoroughly like his son. He would be the firstborn among many brothers. Those who he appointed long ago he called. Those who he called he declared righteous. Those who he declared righteous he glorified. What does this mean? If God is for us, who can be against us? He didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us. He will certainly with him give us everything. Who will accuse those who God has chosen? It is God who declares us righteous. Who will condemn? Christ died. More than that, he rose. He is at the right hand of God, and he prays for us. Who will separate us from God's love? Will sorrow, hardship, or persecution, hunger, or nakedness, danger, or sword? And so it is written. For you, we are being killed all day long. We are considered sheep to be slaughtered. <clears throat> But in all this, he who loved us helps us win an overwhelming victory. And I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor rulers, nothing now nor in the future, no powers, nothing above or below, nor any other creature can ever separate us from the love God has for us in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Jesus called them and told them, 
We know those who are considered rulers of the nations are lords over them, and that great men are tyrants over them. But among you, it's different. Anyone who wants to become great among you will have to serve you. Anyone who wants to be first among you will have to be everyone's slave. Why? Even the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many people. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We confess our common faith found in the Nicene Creed of page 207 of our back cover. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, the God of his Father before our worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, he God not me, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. Who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again in glory. Judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead. Life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Continue with him.
Savior, Jesus Christ, your brothers and sisters in Christ. Today we celebrate James the Elder. That is to say, James who is the brother of John, who wrote the Gospel. The pair being the sons of thunder, Jesus called them. He was one of the three who was always with Jesus. Peter, James, and John. You see their names consistently throughout the Gospels. He is the one who asked, with John his brother, asked to be seated with Christ in his glory, one at his left and one at his right. And instead, was promised to be baptized and drink the cup that Jesus was being baptized with in drinking, persecution, and death. And indeed, we see in our Acts lesson today, Herod Agrippa killed James with a sword during the Passover festival. We don't know why exactly. Some have conjectured that uh, he was trying to, because uh, we see it from his arrest of Peter, and he went after Peter because many of the unbelieving Jews were, were happy that he did this to John, and that means it to James. And so, at least know from history somewhat that Herod Agrippa, I think it's the son or grandson of Herod the Great, uh, well, he was trying to do his best to get on the good side of, of the Jews. He wasn't really, well, I guess he was. I think his mom may have been Jewish. But he wasn't on the Davidic seed. But he was trying to ingratiate himself towards the towards people of God. And so he had, maybe he had James killed, because James, of course, was a powerful preacher, proclaiming Jesus Christ as the true Messiah. And if his sermons followed anything like Peter's sermons that we see in the Gospels, that we heard in the book of Acts, where he's, you know, Peter's always saying, you killed the Lord of glory. You killed the author of life. Messiah, the God. And of course, how would you follow the gospel? Repent. Believe. Jesus Christ be baptized into his name. So, some of them didn't like that. Because they were laying the blood of Jesus at their feet. I guess they were afraid that the people would kill them. And of course, you know, all he had to do really was accept that, confess it, and believe that very same blood was they spilled out innocently, the innocent blood of Jesus. And they would receive the forgiveness of sins and he wanted everybody else. The church would be after them. And they never were after them. Nevertheless, whatever reason, Herod kills James, the elder, with the sword. In case you're wondering who, who James the less is, that would be our Lord's brother who wrote the letter of James. Well, this takes us to our epistle lesson. Romans chapter 8. Paul writes, We know that God works things, all things out for good for those who love God, who are called according to his plan. Well, you know, you may not think that this worked out all too well for James. And if you listen to certain branches of Christianity, which seem to teach in one way or another that if you're a Christian, everything in your life should go swimmingly. Every, if you're a Christian, you're, 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 you're going to be blessed with tons of money, a beautiful car, a beautiful wife, a beautiful boat, a beautiful house. Everything just goes wonderful. You have best friends, whatever. If you've been practicing Christianity at all, you know, well, maybe that's just not the case. Did this promise hold true for James? Did all things work out for good? Certainly he is one who loved God and was called according to his plan. He was beheaded. Does that sound like all things worked out for good? What does Jesus say? Well, in Matthew chapter 5, he says, 
Rejoice and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Indeed, James shall receive his reward. You may not see the good promised here in this passage in your life. You may need to wait for the kingdom of God. For instance, this calls for faith. Calls for faith. And indeed, God is going to work all things out for good for you who love God and call according to His plan. You may you ask yourself, well, do I really love God like I should? And how do I know I've been called according to His plan? Well, I got good news for you. You're here. God gathers his holy people, so you're in the right spot, and maybe you're baptized. There, God put his name on you. No one smells tomatoes at me yet, so you probably do love God. <laughs> I'm speaking for him right now. Speechless, that's what you look to. When and where did I know that God called me? In time, he called you there at baptism. In time, he called you and he brought the gospel to you and you believed. And certainly, you come to faith in him and love him. The following also applies to James and therefore to you too. <clears throat> Paul writes, those whom he chose from the first, he also appointed long ago to be thoroughly like his son. But he would be the firstborn among many brothers. Those he appointed, he long ago he called. Those he called, he declared righteous. Those he declared righteous, he glorified. What great promise Paul is placing before you. It's something that no doubt James held on to as he was arrested and facing death, awaiting to be accused, executed, and when he was executed. Chosen. Indeed, Jesus chose all his disciples. It was all the apostles, including James. And you were chosen for the foundation of the world. But you know it happened in time when you were baptized. Appointed. You have been appointed to eternal life. You have been appointed to receive all the good things of God in Christ Jesus. And you were chosen and appointed to be like Jesus Christ. And this is not your doing. Thanks be to God. This is God's working in you through the gospel, through the forgiveness of sins, through the promises, through the sacraments, to conform you to look like his son, Jesus. You know, before we did anything good, before we did anything bad, we were appointed. We are appointed and we called through the gospel. To be declared righteous on account of this faith that believes these promises. On account of the faith in Christ's work. And the chosen appointed be glorified for this remain to conform to the image of Christ. And of course, being conformed to the image of Christ in this life sometimes means bearing the cross. We are going to have trials, tribulations. Things are not always going to go well for us. Things may start to go wrong for you, get worse, and stay worse till you die. It may not get any better than this. It may not. We believe promise. Remember, God didn't save us for this world. Jesus didn't die on the cross so you'd have your best life now. He died on the cross 
So when he ushers in his kingdom, when he returns and restores creation, right? earlier in Romans chapter 8, Paul says yeah, that the, 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 all creation is groaning, waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. Because when we're revealed, when we're when we see our redemption, we are transformed and look like Christ now in his glorified body, then the world also is transformed as well. His redemption takes place. And it is in that world, in God's kingdom, that we see the full fulfillment of all of God's promises. It's your best life then. And it's for all eternity. So when it seems that everything is going against you, you need to cling to these words. Remind yourself of these words and live as if it is true. Because it is. Paul further writes, what does this mean? If God is for us, who can be against us? He didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. He will certainly with them give us everything. Who will accuse us whom God has chosen? It's God who declares us righteous. Who will condemn? Christ Jesus died more than that rose, and he's at the right hand of God, and he prays for us. Who will separate us from God's love? Will sorrow, hardship, persecution, hunger, nakedness, danger, or sword? For it was written, for you, we are being killed all day long. We are considered sheep to be slaughtered. But in all this, he who loved us helps us win an overwhelming victory. Not convinced of neither death, nor life, neither angels or rulers, nothing now, nothing in the future, no powers, nothing above or below, nor any other creature can ever separate us from the love of God has for us in Christ Jesus our Lord. And you know, there's, there's much out there that we may fear. And cause us to doubt this sometimes. And yet, I want to tell you now, how can we fear Marxists, or socialists, or fascists, or Democrats, or Republicans, or unjust judges, or China, or Russia, or atheists, or BLM Inc., or Antifa, or homosexuals, or mentally illnesses out there? You know, this whole thing, you know, where the whole country seems to be mentally ill and accepting things that are mentally ill as insane, right? Criminals, illegal immigrants, or whatever boogeyman men may conjure up in your mind today, we, how can we fear those things with this promise? If God is for us, who can be against us? None of these things win in the end. They may seem sometimes that they have the upper hand and cause misery in our lives. If God is for us, who can be against us? And the evidence, this is so. The evidence that this is so, that God is for us, is we look to the cross, we look at the crucifix, we see that God did not spare his own son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Cross. Any doubt, God is for us and not against us, Look at a tree. Find two intersecting lines. Cross your fingers if you have to. To remember the sacrifice God made for you on the cross. The sacrifice the Father prepared for you in Christ Jesus. He did that for you. That you may know his great love. No one can accuse us before God the Father in Christ. No matter what you may have done in your life, no matter how bad it may have been, no matter how much struggling you may be doing, having a one sin, you keep committing it over and over again. And you keep on coming back to God and going, I hate this, I don't want to do this anymore. No one 
and accuse you before God the Father in Christ. No one can condemn us in Christ. There's no condemnation in Christ. Are you baptized? Do you believe Jesus died for your sins? There's no condemnation for you. Who's going to accuse you? Who's going to condemn you? God the Father sent Jesus. Jesus is sitting there at the right hand of the Father with his blood, pointing, pointing it out to God and saying, See this blood, Father. That was for you, and for you, and for you, and for you, and all, all the rest of you, too. It covers, their, their sin is covered by my blood. I paid the price with my life. No one can separate us from God's love and from Christ. Nothing. With Christ, God the Father gives us everything. Not in this life. The Lord's Supper is a token. His true body, his true blood for the forgiveness of sins. This is a down payment on what's to come. So we partake of his true body and blood. Should we get up to heaven? And God said, Well, I don't think so. You take it. Now here's all his body and blood he gave me. He promised. You don't lie. You gotta keep your promise. God Christ, God the Father, give us everything. Now we may be as sheep to be slaughtered, but in Christ we are more than conquerors. In Him we have won the overwhelming victory. And I was looking. The pastor, churches are dwindling. Early, no one will believe our message. Like people in church, they won't come. We're still in the overwhelming victory in Christ. And they're killing people, all Christians all over the world. It's a shock. Did not Christ promise us this? We have the overwhelming victory in Christ because we do not look for the blessings of Christ in this world. Well, he certainly blesses us with many things. Anybody here been starving lately? Anybody, I don't know, everybody looks like they have clothes for today. They're sitting in an air-conditioned building, thanks be to God. You just never know. You never know when all is gone. There are still congregations like Canada have haven't met personally years. Year. Pastors get up, they make a video, they show another thing. People get to chat with one another on the chat, maybe perhaps. Some places in other parts of the world can't gather together like we're gathered together now, thanks be to God. Well, I, I, in the woods or a graveyard or somewhere else, isolated, where no one else would see us. I said, we're having service over here, guys. No one can see us. We're going to find it. There's plenty of caves in Missouri. We're going to go find one and have service there. They told us we couldn't meet here. What can separate us from God's love in Christ? Death? No. Life? No. Angels? Rulers? No. The present. No. The future. No. Past. No. Powers. No. Anything that's above. No. Anything below. No. Any creature in all creation. There is absolutely nothing that can separate you from God's love in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Sometimes people may want to try to think, you know, God does he must not love you very much. You know, Job's friends, you, you must have done something pretty horrible for this to be happening to you. What did you do? If you just have
had enough faith, they said, then all this wouldn't happen. Oh, I'm pretty sure James had plenty of faith. He got killed by a sword. In fact, all the apostles except John died a martyr's death. John's, I guess, curse was to have to live long enough to see it all. Everybody knew. So, he had to go spend some time on Patmos and Exile. They all trusted these words. They all preached these words. They all lived by these words. James died trusting this more than, than that he lived trusting this. You too are called to live trusting this. Face all obstacles in your life, trusting this. Living through any pain, disease, illness, any bodily trouble, in all financial situations, in facing a day or facing tomorrow, looking to your past. Trust these words of Paul are true for you. For God has indeed chosen you in Christ Jesus. May the peace of God is beyond all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We rise for prayer.